<laughs> Alpha team report. Nothing. You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Green light, yes, sir. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in Bourne. He has to be put down. And you obviously cannot do what has to be done. I am. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the courts. We But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is December 1st, 2016, the first day of December. And we are coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday, now at 6 o'clock Pacific, uh, 9 o'clock Eastern on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which now is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen to the live stream on uh, Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And, of course, we are always happy to hear from you. You can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or via Skype, username, nonpartisan, liberty for all. And that's all one uh, word. And you can also check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com where you can get all of the contact information if you forget the number or username or any of that. And you can also get articles and blogs and, and other things as well. So definitely check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. So Today, um, and this really came out of yesterday's show, uh, it, I started to think about it because I didn't think, well, I had thought that um, Ken Shorjan we have on every uh, other Wednesday to speak on uh, geopolitics and the economy. Um, which he is a expert on. Uh, he writes for the Daily Economist, so you can check him out at thedailyeconomist.com. You can also check out his podcast on YouTube uh, live Mondays and Wednesdays and sometimes Fridays and at Ken Shorjan. But one of the things that came up, and, and I've known Ken uh, a while now, it's been a couple of years, I think, and... Uh, you know, I talked to him, of course, outside of the show, and I've, you know, met him personally as well. But one of the things that came up yesterday on the show had to do with, um, he just had mentioned something about, you know, getting good people in. And it, not that I, I necessarily think he believes that, oh, if you get all these good people in that things will change and whatever. But the, the whole point of what 
I represent and what I'm trying to do and what I stand for and the whole reason I do this show it's not about getting good people in. People have been saying that for years. Uh, you know, oh, if we only got the good people in and follow the Constitution. But even if that happened, that is not the goal. That does not do anything to get rid of all of these oppressions that I'm talking about. They still exist. Because when you have a ruling class, it doesn't matter if, if they're good or bad. That's not the point. Now, it so happens that usually in a government, they're going to be bad. And part of that, I mean, for many reasons, but I think the main reason is that's the whole purpose of, the gov of government anyway. And the people with money are going to back those people that are going to go in there and that want control and are going to take more control and get more involved in people's lives and take total control of everything, which again, as I explained before, the way I view a government. Now, I was listening to some things today, uh, actually Judge Napolitano, and he was talking about the Constitution and how they had said that and I think this is just a way of convincing people they need a government, that government's only there to protect your freedoms and that without government, you won't have any freedoms because they won't be protected, which is total bullshit to me. And I think that's just a phrase or a way to manipulate somebody into thinking that they need a fucking government because Again, if you look up the definition of government anywhere, the word control is in there. And I look at government as a way to take power and control people and lead to the end goal of controlling every aspect of everyone's life and as well as just controlling everything. But I mean, along with controlling uh, all the people that are in that geographical area as well. That's what I look at as a government. So government to me is inherently evil. No matter who is running it or who's in it or uh, who the president is, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's inherently evil. Now, I believe that... Where we're at now is everything is rigged and whoever ends up the president, they're there to carry out that agenda. And that's why they're in there, because everything is rigged. So they've gotten to that point. But even if it wasn't at that point, I still believe that government is inherently evil. Because think about who would want to be a president or a congressman or a senator from the beginning, even if you didn't have a corrupt government. It's it's the same thing as you look at certain jobs or careers that certain personality types are attracted to that because you're ruling over people. You're telling people that you know what's best for them and you have control over them. And there are certain people that are attracted to that. People that want control. Um, so people that want control, they want power. They want to rule over people. So that's what you're going to get no matter what. So it's like government is built to uh, the concept of government is built to attract those type of people. And if it's not from the origin of it, which I'm beginning to think more and more that from the very beginning, most of the people that were involved with creating the Constitution and essentially overthrowing the government from the Articles of Confederation, I mean, you can debate that whether it was technically overthrowing. It's a technicality either way. 
But I think there were some, uh, and we kind of talked a little about this or touched on it a little last night. There were some people who I think inherently uh, were inherently good and really wanted to have a country where people were free. Um, Washington and Jefferson and maybe a few others, but not many. And what you really had was a ruling class that set up a bunch of rulers. And because I had mentioned, you know, how many people had signed the Constitution, uh, you know, and it was like, what, 54 or something. I mean, so the majority of people even that ex- lived in those times because there were 7 million people was the number that I found uh, in like 1790 something was the population around 7 million people. And of course, you know, it's probably rounded off or whatever, and that's an estimate. But out of those 7 million people, if you say 56 of them signed the Constitution or 54, and how many were actually involved in writing it. I mean, you had uh, the elites, essentially, rich white landowners, uh, overthrow a government that they started in the first place. Now, the overthrow of the, or push, this wasn't really an overthrow per se, but pushing the English out, you know, was fine. That was a revolution really of, I mean, that was almost of self-defense because they were occupying the territory that they were in. So it's like, hey, we're going to defend ourselves to get you guys the fuck out of here if you aggress against us. So that was a war really of aggression by England, if if you really want to look at it. So I have no problem with that. After that, And I know they were worried about, you know, other countries at that time because you didn't have the technology we have now and the weaponry and things like that. But they could have easily just made a all the colonies uh, could have been their own countries or you didn't even really have to have countries per se. There could have been a treaty between the people that if anybody attacks this body of land that we're going to defend it. Uh, we're going to unite to defend it. And then as far as currency, you know, you let the market decide. Of course, the best thing would have been gold. Uh, but you let the market decide what becomes the most popular currency. And that will end up being the currency that's used the most and i would say again gold and or gold and silver or something like that so as far as everything else what was the purpose was it uh you know one one state was going to attack another i mean the purpose to me was so the ruling class could be created to rule over everybody else. And then at that point, now I don't know that at that point they got together and said, okay, well, ultimately we want to control everything and uh, everything everybody does. And it would be pretty hard back then, although, you know, you look at the technology that they had in Nazi Germany, they did have advanced technology compared to a lot of other countries, but they didn't have what we have now um, technology wise, but it would be pretty hard to do back then. They didn't even have cars. Um, But I think that was the beginning of, you know, throwing out the articles of confederation and moving to the constitution in itself was taking more control over the people. And it was without consent. And, it was extortion when it came to any of the taxes. Now, they didn't have income tax, but, you know, they had the Whiskey Rebellion. So right away, I mean, they're essentially violating people's rights from the beginning. 
So this does not just apply to the U.S. government. The difference between the U.S. government that I always talk about is, and I think this has to do with them being such a young country compared to other countries, although there's a whole bunch of young countries now, but it's like they were around, they just kind of split off from another country or, well, I guess that's what the U.S. kind of did, but, um, or, you know, kind of reformed from another country or something like that. But as far as the United States before the United States, it was, there was no organized society. Um, there were the native people there that were somewhat organized into tribes, but not in the way that I guess other parts of the world were, which there's nothing wrong with that. Somehow that made it okay for the settlers, I guess, to take it over because, oh, you're not an organized enough society. I don't know. But that's a whole nother issue that we're not going to get into today. So what I wanted to talk about is, you know, as I've said before, you have all these people that say, well, if we had good people in there and we followed the Constitution, then everything would be okay. And these people are not realizing that that's not one that that's not the issue and two that's never going to happen but even if it did happen it doesn't change a lot and it's funny because i just heard one of uh the douchebag president elect and and don't get me wrong uh If it was Clinton, I'd be saying the same shit, you know, going on his fucking tour where everything is great and he loves everything. Like if you want to play a drinking game, watch like Trump do uh, one of his town halls or I guess he's on a thank you tour. (laughs) And how anytime he says like great because he says everything's great. He wants to make America great. This is great. That is great. But the things that he said, and I paid a lot of attention at the beginning and to the debates and stuff like that, not because, uh, you know, I really wanted to see the debates, but it was something for me to listen to while I was working. And I've talked about, you know, having a job where um, I work mostly on my own on, on a computer in an office all day. So I need to listen to something. So I listened to that, and plus it it was good for, you know, the more I know about what's going on, the better, although I don't watch government media for the most part. But I did happen to have CNN on and watch his uh, part of his speech there in, in Ohio. First of all, who the fuck goes to a speech of a politician man to support in in support of now ron paul i understand to an extent because i think people knew at least for the people that knew the goals of ron paul and the goal of ron paul was not you know to win the election because he knew he wasn't going to win it so i don't know that he really wanted to rule over people but he was a uh representative so he did um so you know you take that how you will um you know i don't know how he got into politics from being a doctor and and whatnot but still it's the same thing with senators or representatives or any office there's a couple things that you can't deny if you run for office, unless the only reason you're running for office is to get your point across. And that's really when it came to president, at least that's what Ron Paul was running for. So I I understand some people that, you know, they went to a rally or something because they saw what Ron Paul was kind of trying to do is get ideas of freedom out there 
And he did it in a way where now I don't personally agree with this because I could come out here and talk about things to ease people into the ideas that I have, which is really just a lot of them are just facts. I mean, some of them are opinion, but a lot of them in, in the opinions are based on facts. But, you know, as when it comes to the government, a lot of them are truths about the government. And I'm just telling the truth about it. But I'm telling the, the extreme, you know, truth. I'm not sugarcoating it or anything like that. Whereas Ron Paul kind of eased people in, because if you listen to him now, at least when uh, he does a show that's not on any national media, he goes a lot further than he did than when he ran for president. Um, so I think what he was trying to do is initially expose people to the ideas of freedom, not to hit them over the head with it, kind of like what I'm doing. And I disagree with Ron Paul on some things, obviously, because if he if he believes in government, then, you know, there's a disagreement right there. But I understand that. But going to any politicians fucking rally, I don't care who it is, is what the fuck is that? So you're going to there to support and celebrate and clap and for your ruler Yes, I'm I'm so happy that you're you're ruling me. That you're my my ruler. I mean, what the fuck is that shit? There's a delayed clap. Um, I think I think this is clapping. I don't know. I can't hear the effects when they come through. But so yay. Um so you're going there essentially uh, kissing the ass of your ruler. And I, I don't understand that. Now, if you went somewhere because you wanted to hear a speech of somebody, whether it's for uh, reporting purposes, you wanted to report on that speech or hear what they're going to say, or you actually like what that person has to say, that's a little different attending a speech. But to go to a fucking rally is just ridiculous. It shows how disillusioned a lot of people are that not only are they sitting there um, wanting to be ruled and looking for somebody to rule them, they're celebrating it. And this guy is just an arrogant fuck, man. He really, and I said that way, going way back to the primaries. Fuck, I said it before he ran for president. I always hated Donald Trump. I always thought he was an arrogant fuck. And of course, in this speech at this rally, he, you know, throws out, well, you know, we clobbered Hillary and this and that and how great this is. And I did this and that's... You know, whether that's an act or I, which I don't think it is. I think he really is that arrogant. Now, the thing about him is you don't know what to believe because depending on who he's around, he acts one way or another way. He says things that are contradictions. I don't know. I still believe, as I have said, that, you know, nothing's going to change when it comes. And when I say nothing's going to change, I'm talking about when it comes to our rights and, and true freedoms. Now, he might create jobs. I don't know. Um, he may improve the economy, although I don't know how anybody could do that at this point, how one guy could somehow improve the economy. And he can't just do a lot of these things on his own. He also needs Congress. So although Obama set a precedent where all these executive orders went beyond what it, the purpose of executive orders were for, although in the Constitution it doesn't say anything about the fuck, fucking executive orders. They use, well, the general welfare clause. How you, you use that is insane. And that's what they do. They just fucking manipulate everything and whatever. Um, 
and get away with whatever they want and do whatever they want. But this guy is just a fucking douchebag, and so is Hillary. And regardless of what you think, the spying will continue. He's celebrating the police. There'll be nothing done when it comes to police. They'll continue to get away with whatever they want. And I don't know that that's for the president to address directly. Although I think it is in a sense that there should be, if they wanted to pass a law where if a cop kills somebody, there's a federal investigation or something like that. But I I don't know that that's something that the federal government should be getting involved in. Uh, However, they're already involved in training and giving all these weapons. And those are things that they shouldn't be doing neither. So the whole militarization, but he's sitting there praising police and the police state will continue. He's going to spend more money on the military. He's talking about keeping everyone safe. I don't, I don't need you to keep me safe, motherfucker. I don't need it. And if you're spending more money on the military, but at the same time, he said, well, we're not just going to attack all these countries, which is a good thing. But what the fuck is the military going to do then? Why do you need a military? Now, of course, he says, well, to scare people. Like, they're not... Okay, so really, if you build the military a little more, there's already thousands of bases and, you know, all of these troops and nuclear weapons and all of this stuff. So... Getting more is going to scare people more. Like, really, it's not to the point where it's enough that it scares people. Is that is that your fucking retarded logic? So he's going to use these troops for something, and maybe it's going to be martial law here. I, I totally see him as a total authoritarian, as is Clinton, as is anybody who's going to get elected president, because, again, it's totally rigged we're at base basically we're getting close to game over for freedom and for us having any rights or being able to make any decisions about our own life that we want. And and I'm I'm dead fucking serious. And these people, that's why I can't get over people that are supposed, you know, called themselves or i don't know if they still do but called themselves anarchist or people like alex jones who said all the shit he said about the government but now trump's the savior oh because he's gonna stop globalism and i guess because that sounds more like like uh beavis or something but um it's like if uh alex jones and beavis kind of merged but it's (laughs) It's not, he's not going to do anything that's going to affect our freedom here. I mean, I'm not worried about all these other fucking countries. And I know you have the international banks, you have the elite and all of this shit. But I'm not worried about them affecting my freedom. I'm worried about the fucking u.s government i'm worried about the police i'm worried about the military if they declare martial law and all of that stuff in the u.s government and the state government so to totally look at this guy i mean alex jones just went like you know nuts for trump and so did Stefan Molyneux, who's supposedly an anarchist, and so did uh, that other douchebag. But he does kind of funny videos where he asks people stupid questions or gets them to sign stupid petitions. I can't remember his name because he's not all that important. Uh, Mark Dice. Um, there was a bunch of people that were big Trump guys that are supposedly stand for freedom because they don't. You know, if I've said this before about Alex Jones, he says all this shit about what he knows about the government and how bad it is. And how can you 
know all these things and how corrupt and how bad and all of this and still want it to exist. It's just ignorant. I, I don't get it. But anyway, anybody, first of all, when looking at people that run for office, you know, these people, they, no matter whether you look at them as good or bad. So I'm sure there's people that are in Congress or governors or in your state legislature that people will look as look at as good, quote unquote, good people. So, oh, we got some of the good people in. And I don't believe that anybody that would go into government at this point is good in any sense. That doesn't mean they're bad. But first of all, you are one accepting or recognizing that the government has authority over people and that you will have authority over people in some sense, depending on what you're running for, whether you have, uh, you're making laws or whatever. Also that you know what's best for people. There's nobody that runs for office that doesn't have a plan and says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And that's part of their campaign. That obviously in saying that, what are you saying? Well, you're saying, I know what's best for you because I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And by me doing this and that, it's going to benefit you. Like Trump, you know, I'm going to make America great again. Things are going to be great for you. You just don't know it yet, I guess. I I don't know. So although different people have different definitions of what's great and this whole, oh, we need to come together. Yeah, we need to come together, meaning the people, not the government. The government is a separate fucking entity. So if you're running for something within government, realize that as well and they you know i'm sure they do it's all they're all corporate entities whether it's the state government or the federal government even towns i mean you're joining a corporate entity you're getting paid extortion money and you want to rule over people because you can't I mean, you can deny that, whether it's conscious or or, or not, but you want to have con- some control over people and you want to rule over people. Unless, I guess, you're somebody who gets in the office to just veto every fucking bill that comes across and you run on the campaign speech that I'm here to get rid of as many laws as I can. I mean, besides that, or you're running and you know you'll lose and you're just trying to spread a message. Like the Ron Paul, you know, kind of philosophy there for president. So to say that, well, we just need to get the good people in there. So number one, the issue with that in itself is that that is not going to happen. One, because you need a lot of people, a lot of money, and government is not designed that way and that it's going to attract good people. Where I just went through, you have to want to control and rule over other people. I like to be in control of what I'm doing. And I like to be in control of myself, but I don't want to be in control of other people. I don't want to rule over other people. You know, if somebody was working for me or something, I still don't want to be in control of them. It, it, it's, you know, 
I have I would have a job for them to do, I guess, and it's you know, but as far as it's not the and also that is a voluntary situation where okay, I'm giving you this, you know, money and you're giving me your time and your work. It's a voluntary exchange where both sides get something. Government is not voluntary. It's forced on you. The social contract is another one of these. The the way government is justified is so fucking ridiculous. And you have these people that say, well, you live in the society so that means you have to contribute to it. And so that means what? I have to pay for your kids to go to school and I have to pay for police that I don't want. And I have to pay. I mean, that makes no sense neither. And not only do I have to do that, but you're going to force me to do that out of the threat of violence. You're going to violently extort me. Or, you know, the threat. Most people do it because of the, well, there's a lot of people that just do it because they feel they have a duty. But most people um, that don't want to do it and end up doing it, it doesn't come down to the violence. It's the threat of violence because they don't take it that far. But that's what it is. And that's a fact as well. So if you join government, you're also joining government knowing that you're supporting violence. You're part of the violence. You're passing laws and being involved in an organization. You're joining, think of it this way, you're joining an organization that uses violence to force people to do things. So uh, how can you be a good person in in the first place. And that's what I'm saying. Government in itself is set up because government along with being uh, about control is also, I mean, the definition of government really is ruling over people by force in a geographical area. And I don't know that I gave the best the way I worded it was the best way to word it but that's what it is so for example the United States would be the geographical area and the government rules over everybody in that area by threat of force if you don't follow these laws we're going to use force against you and it's not just people think it's limited to criminal laws and it's not it's anything. If they didn't use force, then it wouldn't be a government anymore. I don't know what it would be. If taxes were voluntary, then it would be a totally different thing. And that's why I don't understand, you know, I've heard people say they support the non-aggression principle. Um which I never used, I mean, I've used that uh, description before, but I generally, I don't say the non-aggression principle. But basically, it's, you know, not aggressing against somebody else unless you're aggressed upon and then you defend yourself. So... If they were to, if taxes were voluntary, oh, sorry, I was saying that there's people that say they support that, right? But they also want there to be a government. Well, there can't be a government that supports the non-aggression principle because then if it's voluntary, it's not a government anymore. I don't know what you would call it. And, you know, it's an organization but it's not a government because the definition of a government 
has to do with the control and the ruling over people by force. Otherwise, it's not a government. So true libertarians don't believe in government. All the other shit is garbage. The Libertarian Party, fucking all these people that call themselves libertarians that are really conservatives, that's all garbage because the libertarianism is based upon the non-aggression principle and you cannot have government and support the non-aggression principle because government is forced on you. Government aggresses upon you. So going back to, I guess, defining a ruler as good. I mean, you can have a king, you know, and he can be good to you. Does that mean, you know, what happens when he dies and somebody else becomes king? But he's still ruling over you. And this is the whole thing that whether somebody's good or bad, they're still ruling over you. They still have the option to make decisions for you. You need their permission. Um, you're not free, regardless of what the laws are, because you still have a ruler. And if they don't, if they get to a point where there's really no laws, then what the fuck do you need them for anyway? So, and they're still in the business of making laws. You don't have consent. You're still extorted. And you're not equal. Where the... If if all men are created equal, and we know that means, you know, created equal in that equal opportunity, equal under the law, whatever, that people aren't actually literally created equal, that some people have, you know, are smarter than others or have different uh, athletic abilities or whatever. So, but I mean, you know, treated equally under the law. Well, you're not equal to somebody that has a position of a ruler and all of these people in government on some level are rulers. That's what they are. Now there's of course, like I said, there's levels, you know, you could just be on a state level or you could be on a federal level, a congressman or in the house of representatives where, you know, there's 435 people. So you're only one of them, but you're still ruling. They'll call it governing over people and you're controlling people. You're making people ask for permission. You're, you're supposedly representing people that don't want your representation. They want to represent themselves. Not everybody, but I'm saying there are people and you're forcing them, yourselves on them without consent as their representative. I'm your representative. Well, I didn't fucking ask for a representative. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm your representative. I got votes from all these other people. These people gave me the authority. And that's the other thing, too. Where, do, where does any of this authority come from? People don't have the authority to give. No one has the authority to give to somebody else to rule over you. And that's based on one major principle, self-ownership. If you believe that you own yourself, and I don't know how you can't, um, because if you don't own yourself, who owns you? And you say, well, nobody owns me, not even myself. But <laughs> I, I guess if you're looking at self-ownership, right? So if you don't own yourself, who owns you? And really, it's the government. And the government believes that they own you. And even though they haven't come out and said it, their actions show that. 
if they rule over you without consent, they extort you. They do all of these things. They believe they have the authority to represent you and make all these laws that you have to follow. And really, it's by majority rules, because if somebody's trying to defend this, and I'm trying to look to the side of, okay, somebody trying to defend it. Again, you hear the, well, you live in a society uh, that you benefit from, so you have to contribute to it. Okay, so you're saying I have to contribute to all these things that have nothing to do with living in the society, like wars and the weapons and military and plenty of things that have nothing to do with it. Because that would be, to me, the only way you could really justify that if you 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 want to talk about like roads and public sidewalks and shit like that which should be paid for by gas taxes, but obviously they're doing something else with gas taxes. Um, And they're in debt every year. They're upping the debt. Well, they have a deficit. So remember that the debt and deficit are two different things. The deficit is for that fiscal year. The debt is the total on how much is owed, like a running total since forever which I think is at like 21 million. So, I mean, all of these things are facts. And I'm saying that in that things like you don't have consent. And neither did anybody except the elite who signed the Constitution. Even the people alive at that point didn't have consent, but we definitely don't have consent. So what they want to tell you is because you're born in an area. So if you're under 18, you can't leave. So I don't know how you can justify that, but you're supposed to obey that you have some obligation and they have some authority over you. Explain that one to me because, you know, but once you're over 18, You consent because you don't move, which is ridiculous as well. So what does being in the country, again, have to do with paying taxes that go to pay for the military, wars, police when you don't want them? other people's kids to go to school. All of these things that you're forced to pay for because you live in society, all those things you get benefits from, but how you figure. So, and and the majority of the budget goes, of course, to the military and Trump's going to hire that. I don't know how the fuck he's saying he's going to cut taxes and whatever. And I know you can cut taxes and then it, this is the philosophy from what I understand it. So you cut taxes on corporations and I'm not saying they shouldn't because if we, if the United States has the highest corporate tax rate in the world, then there's something wrong. But I don't think there should be any taxes on anything because, of course, I don't think government should exist, so there shouldn't be any taxes. But if they cut taxes, the philosophy is that the business will grow. Therefore, there will be more revenue to pay taxes on. There will be more jobs, so there will be more people paying taxes. So basically, the growth of the tax cut will add to the tax base whether it's by hiring more people or by the company expanding and making more money and paying more taxes because they're making more money. So it's not that they're paying a higher percentage. It's that they may be paying the same amount of taxes because they're making so much more money. So dollar value, they may be paying the same amount of taxes, but percentage-wise, they're not. So... 
that's, I guess, the idea of, I mean, how they want it to work. It doesn't always work out that way. But I don't believe that anybody should be be paying taxes. And that bothers a lot of people because, oh, those rich, the rich people or and they think everybody's fucking, you know, the rich people are are what like that make over a million dollars. What percentage makes over a million dollars? Maybe like 10 percent. The one percent is like, you know, I think in the billions, but. The money ends up going to what? The government instead of the people. And what does the government do with it? Goes to the military, the CIA, buying more weapons, the NSA to spy on us. So, you know, this whole thing that we have some obligation to pay taxes because you live in a society that you were just born into and you're supposed to leave because you don't believe that you should have to pay any taxes. If I use something, uh, fine, I'll pay for it. I have voluntary taxes. And I won't pay for police because I won't use them because I don't fucking need them because all they do is make the situation worse. And roads, I pay for gas. So there you go. Of course, we could get roads... Uh, you know, in a society without government, there are ways that we could get roads built, okay? There's been a lot more complicated things done that government had nothing to do with than fucking pavement that you can drive on. So when it comes to self-ownership, the government totally ignores that. And that's really where your rights come from. Your rights come from being a human being, but also owning yourself. Because if you own yourself, you have these rights that come with self-ownership and being a human. Or if you were to express it in a religious way, you could say, you know, your rights come from your creator or whatever. And that is more just, I mean, you, you look at the authority of government and their ownership of you that they believe what gives government the authority to own you? Because really what, what gives government the authority to own you is a bunch of men with guns when it comes down to it, that, and you have a certain amount of the population who's been brainwashed and whatever, who believe that the government has authority because people gave them authority, but people don't have the right to give government authority over other people. You can give government authority over yourself, but you cannot give government authority over somebody else. It's just like if there's a vote to hang a person for no reason, you don't have the authority to do that or the right i mean technically yes you have enough people that you could drag that person and you know hang them or whatever or shoot them but you don't have some kind of legitimate authority it's based on nothing the go- any government's authority is based on nothing unless every single fucking person Agree to every single fucking law. But then what about next generations? And then they say, well, we don't agree to this. Well, then you can't push your shit on them. And I don't know why this is so hard to comprehend or... And maybe people comprehend it, but they just disagree with it. But... 
most of it of what I'm saying right now, if not all of it, is just facts. It's truth. The government has no authority. You as a person have no authority over anybody else unless you've made a voluntary agreement without their permission. So like if somebody works for you, you have authority over them while they're at work. But that was an agreement that you made with them that they can at any time leave or uh, withdraw from that agreement. So I'm going to take a quick break and play some uh, clips related to this. And when we come back, we'll talk more about government and government authority and getting how good rulers and even good, quote unquote, good laws or a good constitution still doesn't mean anything. So it's just a way to control people or get them to submit because, oh, this is good. But if it's good at one time, of course, that obviously uh, can end up not lasting. So we'll be back after this or after these clips, nonpartisan liberty for all. Dot com. Law Without Government Part 1 Principles What is government? Government is defined as a territorial monopolist in the field of producing law. It is the sole provider of law, the ultimate decision maker, arbitrator and wielder of force within a territory. As a monopoly, it maintains its position by using aggression, the use or threat of violence, to prevent competing providers of law from emerging. Government is the only organization that uses the political means, that is, the widely accepted use of aggression to attain wealth. For example, the monopolist declares its own act of theft to be legal, calling it taxation and enforcing compliance. Everyone else must attain wealth using the economic means producing something of value to others and then engaging in voluntary acts of trade. Government is a territorial monopolist of law, but what is law? Interpersonal conflicts are possible due to material scarcity of resources and goods and diversity of interests between individuals. The potential for conflicts makes property rules and ownership rights necessary for social cooperation. For example, apples are scarce, and this means that if two people both want to eat a particular apple, they cannot both be satisfied. For conflict avoidance, we need property rules to establish who has the ownership right over the apple, that is, who has the right to decide how the apple is used. Laws are property rules that emerge from the resolution of conflicts. The production of law, the resolving of conflicts, is a service provided by an arbitrator, or judge. Imagine two individuals stranded on a desert island, Adam and Ben. Adam picks a supply of apples, but then Ben comes along and takes an apple without Adam's consent. That's my apple, because I picked it. It's my apple, because it was on my tree. With no one else on the island, Adam and Ben have no one they can turn to for help resolving this conflict. They may succeed in negotiating a peaceful settlement, or they may resort to physical violence. Now suppose there is a third individual on the island, Charlie. Now there is another possible way for Adam and Ben to resolve their apple conflict peacefully. Ask Charlie for his opinion and agree to whatever resolution he suggests. We're having a dispute over an apple. 
both of us claim it as our own. Will you arbitrate for us? This is third party dispute resolution. Adam and Ben both make their cases to Charlie. Charlie must decide who he believes has the stronger claim to the disputed apple, and then pronounce a judgment on the case. I do not think Ben owned the tree, so I award ownership of the apple to Adam. Charlie has just produced a law. He has made a judgment about who the rightful owner of a disputed property is. He has awarded legal ownership of a property to one of the disputants. But Adam feels that it would be unjust if Ben only has to return the apple he stole. Adam wants Ben to be punished and wants compensation for having his time wasted. He insists that Ben pay him five additional apples and then he will consider the matter settled. Unable to resolve this dispute between themselves, they ask Charlie for his opinion. Charlie recognises the need to compensate Adam for his lost time and to punish Ben. His opinion is that a payment of two additional apples from Ben to Adam would be a just resolution to this conflict. Since the purpose of Adam and Ben turning to Charlie was to help them resolve the dispute peacefully, both men will agree to his decision. If one of them does not, then they are back to having to resolve the conflict between themselves, either peacefully or otherwise. By arbitrating on a conflict and helping to resolve it peacefully, Charlie has produced a law. Now suppose some time later on the island another conflict occurs, this time between Adam and Charlie. If they cannot resolve the dispute between themselves, they could ask Ben to arbitrate for them. I'll arbitrate for you. When Ben provides them with his opinion on the conflict and suggests a resolution, he too will have produced a law. And if Ben and Charlie ever get into a dispute, they could ask Adam to produce a law for them. There are multiple producers of law in this society. No single producer of law is in a privileged position. There is no ruler and no one is ruled. Everyone is of equal status with respect to the laws. What would a monopoly of the production of law look like on our island? I'll arbitrate for you. No, you are not allowed to arbitrate. I am the only one who can produce law on this island. My law is the law. The injustice of this arrangement would be immediately apparent to both Adam and Ben. But that would mean that you even get to be judge in disputes you are involved in. And you could do whatever you want, like steal from us and order us around, and call it legal. That's right. I am the state. Charlie could only establish himself as ruler and maintain that position if he could somehow convince Adam and Ben that a ruler is necessary, and that with no ruler, anarchy, there would be chaos and disorder. If Charlie is able to maintain a monopoly of arbitration and ultimate decision making, he would have put himself above the law, and Adam and Ben can no longer be considered free men. Now suppose there are a few more individuals in this island society, and two of them have a dispute that they cannot resolve peacefully among themselves. The disputants have a choice of arbitrators that might help them resolve the conflict. There is competition in the production of law. Who will they choose? The ideal arbitrator will be someone who is impartial and who has a good reputation for being fair, honest and wise. With a larger population, some individuals who possess these qualities may find that they can make a living purely by providing arbitration services to disputants. They will be professional judges and may create firms selling laws. Their consumers will be disputants who need help resolving a conflict and their income will depend on their reputation for making wise and fair decisions. If any one of them tries to become a monopolist, for example by insisting on being judge in a case involving himself or a member of his family, he will quickly lose his reputation and his livelihood. 
the principles of having competition in the field of law do not change as society becomes larger and more complex. In my next video, Law Without Government Part 2, I apply the principles outlined here to a large and complex society. Where food production is monopolised by the government, it can be hard for the people to imagine how it could ever be any other way. They fear they may starve without government to plan and direct food production. They cannot imagine how a free market in food production could possibly work let alone how much better off they would be with that system. They are too accustomed to having food provided for them by the government. We are accustomed to a society where the arbitration and law industry, the court system, is monopolised by the government. We fear chaos and disorder without government to plan and direct law. We find it hard to imagine how a free market in law could possibly work. In this video I will outline how law and security could be provided by competing voluntary institutions. This is Alice. Alice lives in a free society, where security and law are provided not by a government, but by competing firms. Like most people, Alice demands to feel secure in her person and property. She does not want anyone to aggress against her. Alice also demands that if someone does commit aggression against her, she will have the means to bring the aggressor to justice and receive compensation for her losses. A number of competing firms exist to try and satisfy these consumer demands. The firm Alice subscribes to, Dawn Defence, has a good reputation for preventing crime and for obtaining justice when crimes do take place. Alice pays her security bill monthly, the same way she pays for her electricity and telephone services. She is on a standard package, which suits her budget and her lifestyle choices. She has chosen an insurance option, so that if someone steals from her, she is guaranteed quick compensation. One evening while walking home, Alice becomes a victim of aggression, and she is mugged at gunpoint. At the earliest opportunity, Alice calls the emergency service number and is put through to Dawn Defence Emergency Response Centre. They quickly dispatch agents to her location. Unfortunately, by the time their agents arrive on the scene, the mugger is long gone. The agents examine the crime scene and gather witness statements and any evidence that might help them identify and locate the mugger. As specified in their contract, Dawn Defence pays Alice compensation for her losses, enough to cover the possessions taken from her and a good deal more for her time, trouble and distress. Alice's part in this story is now over. Dawn Defence, however, will want to bring the mugger to justice. They will want to recover their costs, and they have promised their customers that muggers will not get off lightly. After doing some detective work, Dawn Defence identifies with reasonable confidence Bill as the aggressor. They locate him and issue him with a written demand that he pays them $10,000 as a punishment for the crime he committed against Alice. Bill has two choices. He could admit his guilt and pay up so that Dawn Defence leaves him alone, or he could refuse to pay. Bill refuses to pay, claiming he is innocent. Dawn Defence will not want to have a reputation for harassing or using force against innocent people, so it will listen to his case. After hearing his case, if they remain convinced of his guilt, they will insist on payment threatening to use force against him if necessary. Bill now faces the same two choices. If he still refuses to pay, Dawn Defence will send armed men round to his house to enforce their punishment. What if Bill has his own security? After receiving the first letter from Dawn Defence, Bill calls Tanner Justice, 
the security agency he subscribes to. He tells them he is completely innocent, and that he is being unjustly threatened with force by Dawn Defence. Tanner Justice calls Dawn Defence immediately to discuss the accusation of mugging. They insist on seeing some evidence. They conduct their own investigation. After their investigation, they might agree with Dawn Defence that Bill is guilty. In this case, they order Bill to accept his punishment and will not protect him from any force that Dawn Defence uses against him. Or they might reach the opposite conclusion that Bill is innocent. In this case, they'll stand by their client and consider the threats made by Dawn Defence to be aggressive. The two firms just cannot agree about what events took place. So what happens now? Do they fight it out? Such a war would be costly for both sides and they would suffer reputational damage. Security firms that resort to war soon find themselves bankrupt as consumers switch to their cheaper and more peaceful competitors. Dawn Defence and Tanner Justice have every incentive to find some peaceful way to resolve the conflict. Since they cannot reach agreement about what happened, the two firms agree to pay for an independent arbitrator to look at the case, and agree to be bound by that arbitrator's decision. Since both firms are large and well established, they have a prior agreement about which firm to go to in such cases. Their chosen arbitrator, Benson Enterprises, is a firm that specialises in resolving such disagreements between security firms. Benson's examined the evidence presented by the two sides and listened to their arguments. After careful consideration, they conclude that Bill is guilty of mugging Alice. As agreed, both sides accept the decision. Tanner Justice stand down from defending Bill. Now with no one to protect him, Bill has no other choice but to accept his punishment. Benson Enterprises is a highly respected firm, and no other security firm will agree to defend him now against the force threatened by Dawn Defence, unless new evidence emerges or the reputation of Benson's is brought into question. If Bill cannot afford the $10,000 punishment, Dawn Defence will accept payment over a longer term. They may insist on taking a portion of his wages until his debt, plus interest, is paid, and they may contract with his employer to ensure they are paid on time. If Bill is unemployed, they may insist on taking a more active role in his life. They may force him to work at a place of their choosing. If Bill is dangerous or cannot be trusted to make the payments, they may restrict his movements to a certain region, or, as a last resort, to a certain building, a secure workhouse where criminals are held while they pay off their debts to their victims and serve their punishment. Bill's crime against Alice will be noted by the various competing criminal records bureaus, and his identity will be made public in databases and in the media. Security agencies now consider Bill a higher risk for committing further crimes and may take steps to protect their customers from him. Bill may find it difficult to find a security firm that will accept him as a customer, and if he does, he may have to pay higher premiums for it. Because of his record, other business owners may refuse to employ or trade with him, and landowners may not permit him to enter their land. The performance of the security agencies is noted by various competing watchdog organisations that provide consumers with information about the quality of security in arbitration firms. The details of the case are made available to auditors who check that the practices of the security and law firms adhere to quality standards. We cannot know in advance how the security and arbitration firms will be structured. We cannot know how many firms will operate in a given area, or how large an area a typical firm will cover. In this video, the two security firms performed a number of distinct functions themselves. Free market competition is needed in order to know 
whether all these functions will be provided in-house, or whether some would be outsourced or provided by distinct firms. All these related industries keep the firms satisfying consumer demands for security and law true to their function of protecting individuals against aggression, serving justice, and maintaining order in society. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe, and everything? Listen in to the Illumination Hour, Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Listen live at Spreaker.com or NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and iTunes. The Illumination Hour, brought to you by Nonpartisan Liberty for All Media and Radio Network. And your host, Ellen Stallone. Because a spark can illuminate the world. You are listening to Nonpartisan Liberty for All Radio with your host, Dave Bourne. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and we are back. Thank you for tuning in on this Thursday evening. So tonight we're talking about if the people in government were quote unquote good. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, if we get the good people in there and they follow the constitution. Now, one of the things that I really didn't talk about um, is what's the definition of good to different people. So of course to a progressive Somebody who's good is going to be totally different than someone who wants to follow the Constitution. The the people that I hear all the time that talk about, you know, good, we need to get the good people in there, are usually people that are um, saying or complaining about government and saying, well, we need to get the good people in there and follow the Constitution uh, because that's how things should be or whatever. But that's very subjective. And as I went through, and I kind of would compare this to police to an extent. However, I don't think it's exactly the same thing, but in a way, well, actually it is in, in a, in a sense, but I've come to the conclusion that all cops are bad within their job. And I've talked about this many a time, but for people who haven't heard it, I will uh, briefly mention how I come to this conclusion. So one, of course, is my experience with police, and I've had experiences with police in, Jesus, four states. My research, which I've done so much of and talking with other people and, you know, internet research and articles and all of that videos. Um, there's so much of it now, um, as well. And even before that, you know, everybody that I knew had had bad experiences with police. So I have that. And then I also, like I said, I have my own experiences where, you know, you can't tell me that, oh, well, that doesn't happen. And the per- people that told you that lied or whatever, I'm, I've seen it firsthand. I, I've experienced it firsthand. I've been arrested for things that aren't crimes because the police were fucking with me. And they even admitted that they were fucking with me. So um, all of those things. But that doesn't say that every single cop is bad. That says the majority are. And now I can actually say this because this person doesn't work there. But at work, there was actually this woman I worked with who she twisted it around and tried to say that I uh, 
wouldn't talk to her. It wasn't even a big deal to me after the fact. She was like, I can't believe you think all cops are bad and, and, you know, started acting all fucked up to me. And then after it, uh, we had our discussion, I was just like, whatever, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. That's how she is. Um, she was always like that where, you know, she's always right. And you got to be careful what you say around her. But after that, um, she was an older lady after that, I was like, whatever, it's not a big deal the same day. And then I noticed she totally changed how she acted towards me. So I would still say hi to her and then she would even stop, stop saying hi to me. So I, I was like, okay, um, I'm not going to say anything to her anymore. And I, so I stopped saying hi to her, but that stemmed from me having a rationale as to why I came to that conclusion. And I'm not finished yet why I come to when I say all, but she had said that, well, I think cops are good because I met this cop once and he was nice to me basically. So she, her rationale was based on one experience of one cop and she, her being a woman. And I don't know when it was because when she was younger, she was, uh, I saw old picture. She was somewhat attractive. So, you know, cops are going to be nicer to attractive women in general, um, especially when the majority of cops are male cops and a lot of the female (laughs) cops are lesbians, not all of them. So no offense to the, well, I don't care if I fucking offend cops. So fuck you. Anyway, the reason why I think all cops are bad and those three things uh, are part of it. But the main reason is because the one thing that all cops do is they kidnap people. No matter whether you're a detective now or whatever, at some point you were a patrolman and all patrolmen at some point have arrested somebody for possession of at least uh, cannabis. And because you own yourself, even though the government passed a law that made drugs illegal, and a lot of people don't know this, all drugs were legal until 1914. There, were, there was no substance that you couldn't put in your body before 1914. So let's get that uh, straight as well for the people who don't know. So... That's the way governments work, and especially with with the U.S., which I've talked about a lot and had kind of said earlier how they've done things in a way to give people an illusion of freedom, and they slowly took away people's freedoms, as opposed to a dictator who people can point right away, he's evil. They create this illusion so people don't stand up, but... Just because the government, who has no authority to do this, because the people have no right to say what me or anybody else can put in their body. They only have a right to say what they can put in their own body. They have no, you know, well, the people voted or whatever, and, and or they voted those people in that made those laws. It's irrelevant. So just because they bow down to the authority of politicians and go along with it because they do have discretion, they have all arrested people for drugs, possession of drugs. And I'm talking nonviolent things where they search somebody and they have drugs on them. So they have all kidnapped people, which is a crime. And there is no disputing that being a crime. Because you are directly interfering with somebody's freedom. You have a victim. Uh, you are putting them in a cage. It's, it's not only just a crime in that sense, but like if somebody hits you, it's over. And if you don't have any permanent damage, and hopefully, you know, if somebody just hits you or you get in a fight, you don't have any permanent damage unless you deserve it. But uh, I don't think anybody, for the most part, deserves permanent damage. I guess there's, you know, if you rape somebody's daughter or something like that, whatever. But 
in general. Uh, but they not only handcuff you and kidnap you, they put you in a fucking cage like an animal. So all cops have done that. So all cops are bad. They, all cops commit crimes. That is a crime. Just because the government says it's not a crime does not mean it's not a crime. And just because something is a law doesn't mean it's a violation of your rights when the police or the government do it. So something could be legal, but it doesn't mean that people have the right to do it. If it's something that is done to you, is what I'm saying. If it violates your freedom or your principles of self-ownership or the non-aggression principle. So when it comes to politicians, they're the ones who made these laws in the first place. So in a way, they're worse. And and this is something to remember as well since, since we're talking about cops. That, you know, cops say, we don't make the laws, we just enforce them. And you'll hear the the intro to my show, I have a clip from this fucking asshole cop who basically says, you know, obey us, you know, comply or die. That's what most cops are now, comply or die. They'll kill people over nothing just because they didn't comply. And a a bunch of Americans will say that's okay, they should have obeyed the police. If they would have obeyed the police, they'd be alive. How you can come to that conclusion is insane, but I guess you don't value human life or you're a fucking piece of shit. But in the case of people that are in government, not all of them were involved in laws, I guess, that have taken away freedoms. But at the same time, you're part of the organization you know, the government might as well be a corporation. I think technically it is a corporation. So you're part of a corporation. Now, that doesn't mean you personally. So it's hard to say that all of them are bad, but all of them work for a corp. Look at it as all of them work for a corporation that does bad things Pol- regarding politicians. And the police are just a gang if if the politicians and the government is the mafia then you know the cops are uh uh you know a street gang that's part of that mafia but so if you're in government i come to the conclusion that you can't really be good But at the same time, there's not something that everyone in government does personally. They, well, they do take an oath to obey the Constitution, which I think does violate people's freedoms. It doesn't go far enough in protecting freedoms. But not everyone in government does something, whereas every cop has arrested somebody, unless you've been on the job for like a month or something, but you will. Um, and they know that going in. So if you don't want to be a criminal, don't become a cop. But so I can't consider anybody in government good. But let's let's go by the definition that people would say. They're good meaning they follow the Constitution, which still violates people's rights. So um, I personally, again, wouldn't consider anybody in government good, but let's let's go by that. So if they had all good, quote unquote, what they considered good people, which one, again, that would never happen. But two, It doesn't make a difference because the problem to me is the system. And it doesn't matter what system of government you're under. I think all systems of government are evil. Government is inherently evil. Now, there's levels of evil, (laughs) you know, where you look at this country compared to this country's government is worse So there's definitely that, just like there's levels of freedom. But 
the problem to me is the system. And not only the fact that it's forced on you, there's no consent and all of that. That's a given. And that's what makes all government inherently evil. But the system of government, the way they operate now, where they pass unconstitutional laws, they ignore their own laws and all of that. So if you say, okay, well, all these good people came in and they followed the Constitution and didn't uh, violate it and whatever, and everything would be great. And I go back to, no, it wouldn't because the Constitution, one, doesn't protect all of our freedoms. Politicians don't control police and things like that. And the system itself is fucked up, whether you're talking about the injustice system, even if you go back to the beginning. So there's no possibility, as far as I'm concerned, of... One, changing the system through the system, getting good people in there, because one, even if you believe that there's good people that you could get in there, it's not going to happen because everything is rigged. But even if it wasn't rigged, these again are people who want to rule over people. They want to have authority. They know what's best for you. And those are the type of people that are attracted to the job. And they're forcing government on you. You need their permission. All the things we went through earlier. So it's not possible. Yet every year you have people that say that. So how do you get people to finally, I mean, what does it take? How many years does it take for somebody to finally abandon the uh, delusion that the system is going to change as long as they get good people in there and follow the constitution. Cause I never heard the other side of it. Like the progressives say, um, as long as we, you know, get good people in there or whatever. I, I never heard anything uh, similar. It's usually people that want to follow the constitution that say things like that. So, how do you get people to let go of that delusion? At this point, it is a delusion because these people have been saying this over and over again for years, or even the people that just say um, things are going to change or we're going to change things through the system. The only people that change things through the system are the people who actually agree with where the system's going as far as where the elite want it to go. And that would be the progressives (laughs) that they would agree with the system because it's going in their direction, but it's not going in their direction because of them. It's going in their direction because the powers that be want it to. So, and these pe- some of these people, man, listen to uh, if it's still even on, and I don't know what they're called now. It used to be left or progressive or on Sirius, and I mean Sirius Radio, and it was just, it was bad. I mean, the things that they would say, I felt like I was in another world. I actually felt like I was listening to the powers that be talk about what they want to happen to everybody else except them where they would be on the top as the oligarchy, but how they want society, the rest of society to be, um, which would encompass, you know, banning guns, having really no freedoms, government doing and controlling everything, uh, all of those type of things. And it's just, it's, it, it's crazy. So, Based on all that, there are no good people in the system. There are no good people in government. Now, just like I've said about the cops before, 
yeah, you can know somebody who's in government, who's a nice person to you, who you can be friends with, who takes care of their family. I'm talking about in their job. And the same with police. I'm talking about in their job. It doesn't mean they're bad outside of their job. It means they're bad within their job. Although, uh, with all the stuff that cops have done, and I can't believe, this is so frustrating to me, and so I'll mention it. You know, Black Lives Matter, who even, it's it's funny because Lord Jamar, anybody who's heard of the group Brand Nubian, and, and if you're not a hip-hop fan, you probably haven't. And if you weren't a hip hop fan of nineties hip hop, you probably haven't. But anyway, he's been in some, um, some acting roles as well. But, uh, brand Nubian is a, I don't think they're still together, but, or they might be, but they're not making any new music as far as I know. But brand Nubian was a hip hop group and Lord Jamar was one of the members. So he said recently in an interview that he doesn't support black lives matter because They're funded by George Soros and how all these other groups that are controlling the group. And, you know, he kind of said the same thing I did, where if you go to their demands, that that has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter, where he, he, well, he mentioned LBG, LBGT things. And I mentioned, um, you know, they had that in there. They had um climate change in there it, things that have nothing to do with the police killing black people so now his his rationale was because they want to be able to control the movement now i think they want to con- but because it doesn't get out of hand and they're not independent and i don't that might be part of it but the main reason i believe is because they want to use it to exploit it with their agenda and that's what they did that's exactly what they did but you even have somebody like lord jamar who's black you know realizing that and hopefully more black people that are supporting black lives matter will realize that now i'm not talking about black lives just in general i'm talking about the organization titled black lives matter so they're a communist front and you can see that from there but i think the real reason was to exploit that because look what it did now besides you know promoting more more socialism more communism things like that more of the progressive agenda by posting you know their demands the other thing it did is it took the cops and all the bad things they're doing out of the media. It was barely in the media as it was because the amount of people that were actually brought up compared to the amount of people that killed, I mean, there'll probably be at least 12, 1300, 1400 this year. And and that's, you know, what we know about. And I'm sure we we have to add a certain amount for um, people that just get killed by cops and they don't ever find out that cops killed them. Either they f- just find a body somewhere or they get rid of the body. And that's probably easy for cops to do in the West, um, especially in places like Las Vegas. But... What has happened is it became all about race. And then you had on the other side, of course, the conservatives that they defended the cops. Some of them defended the fuck out of the cops. And they said, this isn't about race. And they turned it into a racial argument about cops aren't killing people because of race and whatever. They lost the whole point of how cops treat people, how, how cops, uh, abuse people, violate their rights as well as kill them. So that whole conversation, because it happens to people of all races, although it happens to black people, but a higher percentage, we've talked about that. We recognize that we established that, but by focusing on race, it gave the other side an opportunity to make it 
you know, they contributed, of course, to that same thing. And they were able to make it all about race as well. So they deflected the part about what cops are doing and made it all about race. And then you have the people on the progressives that are funding this group, you know, urging them to make it all about race as well. When probably a lot of the people that went to the protests and supported them initially were just about police violence on people and murder and things like that, that they realized that, yes, it happens at a higher percentage to black people, but this is a problem for society in general. So they basically, what was something that more people were realizing and not to say that they still don't realize it, they were able between, and this is how they work together between the progressives and the conservatives were able to get it less about police, about a totally different progressive agenda and about race and then able to divide people at the same time. So it was all political. It was between the two parties or the two groups, party groups, whatever you want to call them, because, you know, conservatives, progressives or Republicans or Democrat, whatever. And they got basically the police off in a way. Now, every time a cop gets killed, that's front page news. Even if they get killed in another state, whereas before you wouldn't hear about that because not many cops get killed. I heard this morning a cop in Washington got shot just one and killed one cop, which something like between 40 and 70 cops a year, maybe get killed by uh, actually killed by people. And maybe out of those probably this year, because that one guy I think shot killed four or six or something, you know, five to 10 are targeted, but not every year. Um, There's probably five to 10 that are targeted every 10 years. It just happened to be this year. Um, I believe those were the only ones that were actually targeted. There might, might've been a couple more, but no more than 10. So it's not a problem, meaning that this isn't some big thing. That's some epidemic. Now the police abusing their power, treating people like shit, murdering people. You're talking about the government murdering people. And if, although even if it's 1,500, is that a big percentage of the population? No, but if your government is murdering 1,500 people, that's a fucking problem. Especially when other countries are like zero or one, or even if you take it percentage-wise, um, of the amount of cops compared to the amount of people. No, it's not a huge amount of people, but you're talking about your government killing people changes the game as far as the amount of people. Now, if it was five, that wouldn't be, I mean, still five people, but would we say that, you know, that's a huge thing. No, because I'd probably say, and it depends on the circumstances, but probably in those cases, they were shooting at the cops. Now, most of the people that the cops killed aren't even shooting at them. And how uh, the Detroit Threat Management Center, which is a security company that is based upon the philosophy of nonviolence, they don't even use guns anymore, but when they did, they'd have to be fired upon first. But part of the reason for that was they were held responsible because the government has a monopoly on force. The cops aren't held to any standard. And that's what all these things that the government runs. They don't have to get better customer service wise. They don't have to improve. They don't have any competition. That's why a free market with competition, it does so many things. 
and maybe we'll do a show about, you know, where we'll focus on free market, not crony capitalism or corporatism like we have now, actual free markets. But I just wanted to add that because that's what they ended up doing. And it's not just Black Lives Matter. It's the other side, uh, the conservatives, the Republicans, you know, that are responsible as well. And that's exactly what they wanted on both sides. That's a, it, because nobody goes after cops, not Democrats, not Republicans, not politicians in general, for the most part. They just don't. They're too scared. So that's one of those issues that they don't they don't really go after. You know, maybe you'll have one or two people, but even when they do, it's like they're, you know, they tread very lightly. So now it's switched where there's a backlash uh, or the conservatives and the Republicans are trying to promote a backlash. Um, White people are trying to promote a backlash. So the backlash is supporting the cops. And, of course, you have Trump out there, how great cops are, and all of this fucking shit. So I don't, I didn't believe they were going to do anything anyway because what they really need to do is just get rid of the cops fully and privatize uh, that. Now, privatizing that is different than outsourcing, just to for people who haven't heard me say this. Prisons are outsourced. When they say private prisons, it's outsourced prisons because taxpayer money goes to the prison. So it's based on taxpayer money. Private means that we, the people, go out and hire whoever we want as security to protect us. And that's how I think everything should be. But Or you take trash pickup, for example. The government doesn't use tax money and get a contract with a with a trash company. You go and look at the trash companies and you hire the best one. What happens is they're competing. So this one is going to you know maybe provide better service or they're going to pick up more often because there there's competition. Whereas when there's a monopoly, which the majority of things government has a monopoly on, and the things that they don't, they're giving corporations by passing certain regulations and things that benefit these corporations, they're giving them monopolies on things, which is even worse. So when it comes, I guess in conclusion with the... uh, point of what we were talking about tonight is one you know there's no even if because there are no right people I said right people you know because they say the right people meaning the good people whatever there are no right people there are no good people um I guess there's levels where you can say this person's more corrupt than somebody else and whatever, but there isn't any, and there's no changing things via the system. Now this is all in regards to freedom. And to me, if government is there, if the original purpose of government was to protect your freedoms and they're oppressing your freedoms, Why should they continue to exist? They shouldn't. Now, I have a whole bunch of other reasons, which I had mentioned earlier, that there's no consent, um, they have no authority, all of that. But if you look at it from that point of view, if government exists to protect your freedoms, which that's what they said when they, that's how they presented it, in the beginning, at least with the U.S. government, to all the states, then why should they continue to exist? Because they're not protecting anybody's freedom. They're oppressing people's freedoms, which is their whole fucking plan. And it will continue and continue. They're like a b- expanding business. You know, as far as a corporation, they're related to a corporation in many ways because they want to expand business. They want to get involved in everything they can get involved in. 
they want to continue to write more and more and more laws. Because the more laws they write, and they're all open to interpretation, basically they can arrest you anytime they want, or they can charge you with a crime anytime they want, or at least get you in court for something that may be even on a civil uh, violation, which can lead to a criminal violation, because if you don't address it, they'll put a warrant out for your arrest. So that's where the country's going. And you fucking morons who say you stand for freedom that think Trump is going to address that in any way except to continue on the path of Bush and Obama and everybody before them, then you're out of your fucking mind. Because that's the way things are going to go. And he's going to have a bigger military to do it if he needs to bring them in too. And I know he made some statement about the military obeying him too. Like somebody asked him, well, what if they didn't obey you? And it's like, you know, Trump has a person, perfect personality for a dictator. And he's definitely an authoritarian. I think that's why they went with him on the other side, you know, he'll do the negotiating to show the people, look, you know, I did this for you or whatever. I did that for you. So I think that the powers that be decided that he would be the best person to advance their agenda. Now, when they decided that, I don't know whether he was picked as a nominee once he announced it or he had, you know, I don't know how all that shit works, but, I do know, well, I don't know for a fact, but I mean, I, well, no, I do. I mean, it is rigged to assert, if you, if you don't believe that it's a hundred percent rigged, it's rigged to a certain extent because look who, you know, the parties control it and money controls it. It's not like the average person can run not for any federal position, not for Congress, not for president. So it is controlled. They give you these, you know, they give you the idea of illusion that you have a choice. And I don't even know why they even fucking bother, to be honest. You know, why even bother? Just fucking... They do it because a certain amount of people fall for it and think that they actually have a choice. The thing is, they don't. The only way I believe that things can be fixed or things can be changed at all or we can do anything to preserve freedom or some amount of it is non-compliance because they have no authority to tell us what to do. They have no authority to push these laws on us. All they have is a bunch of men with guns. That's it. Now, that's a big thing to overcome. And it's scary. But that's all they have. And there's way more of us than there are of them. That's why if we got together, even 20%, of the population in, in one city got together and said, we're not obeying your fucking laws. What are they going to do? They can't do anything. Maybe they'll bring in the military if it was just one city, but if 20% of the overall population of the United States or 30%, um, and maybe not even that many, if we said, we're not obeying your laws, you have no authority. And as I had mentioned, I don't know if people had seen this on Facebook, and I, I pretty much wrote it up. I just need to organize it and do some rewrites. I wrote a Declaration of Independence 2 is what I call it, and I'm going to put it out on every fucking petition site there is. And that's really what it's going to have to do with the authority of the government and that we refuse to obey your laws, and hopefully a lot of people will be down with that, will sign that, will agree with it. I think 
there's probably more people than we know of. There's a lot of people that probably just stay quiet and just, you know, do their thing and whatever. But that's, to me, the only way. And that's what I've been saying for a while now. Noncompliance with self-defense. And I mean that in the sense uh, that you have people who protest and they do civil disobedience where they purposely break the law, but then they consent to getting arrested or they comply. I'm talking about total noncompliance, including getting arrested and defending yourself because you have the right to defend yourself when it comes to any of these bullshit laws. Now, not if you killed somebody, not if you assaulted or raped somebody, not if you stole somebody's property. Although the system is fucked up, no matter how you want to look at it. And even the way that real criminals are treated as far as how they go through the system and where they end up needs to be totally changed, in my opinion along with the court system and all of that, because it's totally in favor in the favor of the government. That being said, those are crimes. But drugs, um, things that are nonviolent, you should never be in jail over fucking speeding because you didn't pay your tickets. They don't even have the right, really, to pull you over or give you tickets as far as I'm concerned. So if a certain percent of the population did that, there's nothing they could do about it. But to me, that's the only way. Civil disobedience is not enough. It's not going to do anything. It might get the attention of the media. Yeah, no one really gives a shit anymore. I mean, people know that we're being spied on. They don't do anything. I mean, some people do, but, you know, the majority is just like, well, whatever. And then we're going and having uh, getting these real IDs being registered in databases. And they tell you, oh, it's because of terrorism. They always give you some stupid reason. It's because of this. It's because of that. It's because of whatever. They're always going to have a reason as to why they take more power and more control. And most of the time, the reason is bullshit. And made up. And that's why they do things like false flags and things like that. And they're jump right on top of things to exploit them. They have bills written. They're just waiting for things to happen or they're waiting to plan it and make it happen. So I'm going to play one more uh, clip if I actually have this one from Larkin Rose and then we'll uh, come back and wrap up the show. Nonpartisan Liberty for all.com. Hey, Larkin Rose here. Uh, One of the first things that people are concerned about when they start thinking about a society without a ruling class is, well, what happens to the nasty people? Uh, Whether you're talking about people who are just kind of negligent or inconsiderate, Uh, play their music too loud at night or leave their trash lying around the woods or whatever it is, um, all the way up to people who run around attacking and murdering people. So people say, well, well, what would happen to them? What would we do about that? Uh, Some people even go so far as to say, if not for government, there would be nothing to stop people from committing murder and, and doing whatever other nasty stuff. And it's funny because when somebody says that, there would be no consequences. They could do whatever they wanted and nobody would stop them. The person saying that is implying that he isn't going to do anything. If there's someone running around attacking and murdering innocent people, the guy who said nothing will happen to them, obviously he's not going to do anything or something would happen to them. 
But not only is he demonstrating his own cowardice when he said there would be nothing to stop murderers, he's also projecting his own immaturity and irresponsibility onto the rest of the world because he's also saying the other 7 billion people wouldn't do anything about it, which obviously isn't true. I would, wouldn't you? If somebody was running around murdering your neighbors, would you just go, well, oh, there aren't politicians and there's nobody with a badge and we don't have tax collectors and bureaucrats, so oh well, I guess they're just out of luck, they're gonna get murdered. Uh, and would, would you not even protect yourself if there wasn't government? Obviously, lots and lots of people, all the same people, would do whatever they could to protect themselves and, and defend the innocent. Uh, to, so to say nothing would happen is just really bizarre. And it comes from having a mentality basically of a little kid in a classroom where the teacher walks out of the room and the kids are just sitting there. We don't know what to do. No authority is telling us what to do. And Johnny's throwing things at me. And there's no teacher to stop him. Ah! Because most people, having been trained into authoritarian mentality, it never occurs to them that they are the ones who should fix anything, who should stop anything. And so when people say, well, what would be done about this and that and the other thing, nasty people doing nasty things, um, the, first, the first thing I ask is, well, what would you do about it? Because people are so into the mentality that there have to be some... If there has to be some master plan and some authority who writes down the law of here is what will be done with those people that people don't think in terms of, well, what would I do about it? Which is why I always ask people, well, what would you do about it? You're a person just as much as me and just as much as the other 7 billion. What would you feel justified in doing if somebody was polluting or playing their music too loud at night or running around murdering people or whatever in between you can think of? Any nasty thing, what would you feel justified in doing about it? Because there's a very basic rule of being a moral human being, which is if it would be wrong for you to do something, don't ask anybody else to do it. And the rule is so simple, so self-evident and obvious that most people will go, well, duh, of course. Trouble is, nobody in the world who believes in government abides by that rule. Nobody. I don't care if you're a constitutionalist, Democrat, Republican, fascist, communist, anything, any kind of statist. There is nobody who believes in government who abides by the most basic rule of morality, which is if it's wrong for you to do something, don't ask somebody else to do it. Because every single candidate, every party, every government always does things that the voters know they themselves have no right to do. And to say something like, well, I'm voting for the guy who's going to tax you less. Well, do you have the right to rob me a little bit less than the other guy? No, you don't. So telling me that, well, somebody was going to rob you more, but I voted for the guy to rob you a little bit less. You are still violating the basic rule of being a human being. If it's wrong for you, don't ask somebody else to do it. Uh, well, that's kind of the second basic rule, the first one being the non-aggression principle. And they actually go together quite well. But when people are in the mindset that there's going to be some major centralized plan to, to deal with whatever, polluters or people who play their music too loud or murderers or whatever else, they have to get out of that mindset. They have to start to think that maybe they are among the people who have to do something about it. So instead of setting what will be done about such and such, well, what will you do about it? What should I do about it? And this doesn't, this doesn't magically make all the problems go away, but the actual practical challenge of dealing with most disputes is trivial compared to the challenge of getting people to think like responsible adults, where they start to think, well, maybe it's up to me. And a while back, I did uh, little events called uh, Escaping the Myth. And one of the little mental exercises I did with these little groups of people is, imagine we're on an island, and we're it. There's no government, there's no authority, there's nobody with a badge, and one of us is running around stealing stuff from other people. He's not killing anybody, but he's stealing stuff. What are we going to do about it? We normal people. There's not a legislature. There's not 911 to call. There's nobody with a badge. It's just people. And so with that specific example, I would ask people, so what do we do? And just off the top of their heads, everybody comes up with solutions that are way better than what government ever does. First of all, every government solution is, all right, step one, I get to rob everybody. That's the government solution. Well, we're going to tax everybody so we have the resources to stop that other robber. 
Well, in the island scenario, nobody is stupid enough or insane enough to start with that, to say, well, let's see, so somebody's stealing our stuff. Okay, first, I get to rob all of you so that I have the resources to protect you from him. Nobody is that insane. Everybody is insane enough to believe that who believes in government. And I did for many years. I was stupid enough to actually think that it was rational and moral to advocate mass extortion in order to protect people. And that's just stupid. So I just believed something insanely stupid for a very long time. Most of the world still believes that. But in a setting where people are, are put on the spot and they're responsible for what happens, they don't do that. They don't say, well, I get to boss everybody around and take their money. Nobody does that. So to me, the challenge is not even coming up with specific solutions to every imaginable uh, dispute or problem, which I don't pretend to know how everything's going to turn out, and I don't intend to be emperor of anarchy. I'm not going to be in charge of the world. But getting people to the mindset where it's up to them, where there's just people, we're it. No legislatures, no people with badges, no authority. We're just people. Suddenly people are way better at solving problems and making things work. Uh, one good example is when there's a, a disaster. Unfortunately, um, sometimes it takes a horrendous event to bring out the best in people. And it brings out the worst in some people too. But when people say, whoa, my neighbor's house is floating away, I'm not gonna wait for FEMA. I'm not gonna dial 911. I'm gonna jump in a boat and go save him. Cause suddenly it's on me. Suddenly I'm the one who has to do something. And when people, when it occurs to people that they're the ones who have to do something, and unfortunately, usually that only happens in a complete disaster area, when it occurs to people and they suddenly take on the responsibility and start to think like adults, their solutions are generally a lot better than any government solutions and ever are. But to get to that mentality, people have to shift from the authoritarian mindset to the mindset of a self-owning individual who realizes there is nothing above me. There is no magic unicorn who's gonna come and save the day, who's gonna come save me from, from polluters or somebody playing their music too loud or murderers or whatever it is, it's just us. And if we realize that, then first of all, people would stop asking me, well, without a government, how would this be handled? As if I'm gonna be in charge. I don't freaking know. What would you do about it? I can tell you what I would do about it. I could tell you what I might suggest, what I might predict, but who cares? I'm one of seven billion people. I'm not gonna be in charge any more than you are. So it's really a mental exercise that people have to think, think over in their own heads with their own moral codes instead of waiting for some outside answer. And it's why I don't usually get into those discussions of, well, here's my plan for how to deal with this and that and the other thing, because my plan doesn't matter. My plan will not be the best plan for any problem you can come up with there will be a million people with better plans than whatever I could come up with. So don't ask me to describe how you are going to fix problems. I don't freaking know. And you can see the mind shift um, in people when they, they grasp that they own themselves and they suddenly realize, oh, okay, well, yeah, there are things we can do to settle disputes, to protect ourselves from attackers, to do this or that or the other thing. But the first step is just grow up. Stop thinking it's somebody else's business to make the world work. Well, how will the poor be cared for? I don't know, what are you gonna do? Well, how will we be protected from this? I don't know, what are you gonna do about it? And there is, it is inconvenient. It's inconvenient to be a free person where you can't just be a kid in the classroom whining to the teacher to save the day and fix everything and make everything work, where you actually have to be a responsible adult. And that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why people like the belief in authority because then they can live with the lie that all they have to do is obey and do as they're told and everything will be okay. First of all, no, it won't be okay. Second of all, you're not even being a human being. You just threw your free will out the window and became somebody's slave in the hopes that that would help humanity. It doesn't help humanity for you to be a slave. It doesn't help humanity for everybody else to be a slave. It does help humanity for you to start thinking as an adult, responsible, human being who owns himself and who accepts that it is your responsibility to figure out how to make the world work. Nonpartisan liberty for all. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, nonpartisan liberty for all. 
nonpartisan liberty for all and we are back just to wrap things up so bottom line is this is not a government for the people by the people this is an oligarchy is what it is and there was even a study done by i believe it was the united kingdom's government that there's an elite ruling class that's what that's how it is And people can deny that all they want. But you have no say in government. You have no say in these laws or anything that the government fucking does. You don't. And if you think you do, try getting something done. Now, maybe on a small local level, something irrelevant you might be able to get done. But in general, nothing important, nothing that matters. You are ruled by a bunch of elites. And you are not going to be able to get into their system and totally change it. Their system is fucked up in the first place, and their system is not about freedom. The only way to at least try to get some freedom back or try to maintain whatever freedom, uh, minimal amount of freedom we still have, I believe is in 100% in noncompliance and defending yourself. When it comes to people, uh, government agents um, attacking you for that or trying to kidnap you for not complying with things that they have no authority to make you comply with. The government has no authority to do anything. The only thing they have is a bunch of men with guns. That's what they are. They're a fucking mafia They're a huge gang. They have no legitimacy. People just believe that. And if people don't get together and stand up, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not somebody who advocates for revolution. I don't. Or any violence or armed revolution. I don't. Because that would just bring in the same shit. Basically, what I believe in is noncompliance and the self-defense aspect and the government just basically like a business that people stop going to. It just pretty much goes out of business on its own. Because once you get the hearts and minds of the people and they actually figure out the truth then I, I I think things will change. But most people are, are too afraid or, you know, and I understand that even to do a show like this, you know, who's not even, which is not even going out to that many people, but, you know, to, to say things like that. So I hope that when I come out with this, uh, declaration of independence part two that people will sign it and it will be uh, sort of a, a a message to the government just like they did back in 1776 that were your laws are fucking violating our rights and you have no authority over us you just have a bunch of fucking men with guns And we believe in the principles of self-ownership and the non-aggression principle to not harm people and actually commit any violent crimes and believe in in non-violence when it comes to that. But these ridiculous laws, you have no right or no authority to force on us. So thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. Uh, Have a great weekend, and I will see you. Well, I guess I won't actually see you, but I'll be back uh, next week. Thanks, everybody. He will defend his police officers. Listen to police officers.